Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insight into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. Podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. Second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speakers' secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts and investors from around the world and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now, let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. In this episode, we are speaking with Paul Straub, managing partner and co-founder at Wireframe Ventures, a seed and early stage VC firm backing missionary founders attacking hard problems in large with a focus on climate and human health. With the firm, they look for founding teams who can build a compelling product, service, that can one day redefine a market or create an entirely new one. Their capital is early, active and patient, leading up to Series A. I was excited to speak with Paul and have him on the show to get his perspective on the climate tech landscape today. Prior launching the firm back in 2016, Paul spent 10 years plus as a VC actively investing in and supporting founders with Claremont Creek Ventures based in Silicon Valley. During that period, Paul and his co-founder identified that there was a clear gap in the market for investing in businesses that had an environmental or human health focus and so a multi-decade need and trend in becoming capital partners with these kinds of businesses. In this episode, Paul will share his view of the headwinds and bumps of the climate clean tech ecosystem and what impact government policies can have on the market. Paul also speaks specifically to the genesis of Wireframe Ventures, how he developed it and where he finds the amazing founders they partner with. Together, we also explore some of his previous investments and discuss which sectors of the climate tech space today he considers promising in terms of return and potential for impact. In the second part of the show, Paul will give his secret sauce for founders looking to pitch to investors successfully and the main criteria that he, as an investor, looks at when basing his investment decisions. He also explains which climate tech founders he is particularly interested to in hearing from. Lastly, Paul gives three bits of advice to founders on how to build a successful fundraising strategy. Paul, welcome to the show. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today. I'm looking forward for this uh, opportunity to hear your story and get up to speed on what you guys are looking at with Wireframe Venture. And it sounds that a lot is happening. As you guys announced recently, a 70 million fund two. 
So congrats. And I'm sure there's a lot to share here. I can't wait to, have, uh, to, to, to start as I have a ton of questions. So welcome to the show. Thank you. No, no, it's great to, it's great to speak with you and, and good to see you again. And I look forward to it. So let's dive in. So before we start, uh, that's the tradition now. Uh, can you please give us a 30 second introduction about Wireframe Venture? Sure. So Wireframe Ventures is a firm that invests in pre-seed and seed stage companies. We're focused exclusively on founders who are working around uh, solutions for the health of people and planet. So that's climate and, and human health. And um, we are, are an active partner with, with founders uh, you know, at that zero to one stage leading up to Series A. So let's start from the, from the top. Can you tell us a bit more about your personal story and background? I mean, what are you passionate about? What do you do besides working on and, and supporting and investing uh, in, in founders who literally change the, change the world or try to make the world a better place? I mean, what makes you feel inspired or like your best self? As I always ask, you know, who is Paul? Yeah. Well, so I, um, I live in the Bay Area, and I, I, but I originally grew up in, on the East Coast of the United States, right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and a big reason I moved out here is because the two things I'm really passionate about, one is being outdoors. So cycling, skiing, running, uh, uh, hiking. And I live in Marin County where there's amazing access to all of those things. Um, and the second thing was being involved with uh, really smart, dynamic ecosystems and communities. You know, I grew up in a place around the federal government in, in the US and things moved at a very different pace. So for me, when I moved to San Francisco in 1998, it was the opportunity both to dive into this really uh, uh, amazing you know, professional community of, of tech and tech startups and also have access to the things that I love personally. So today, 24 years on from, from that move, uh, I have a family, which is kind of the, the, the most important thing. And, and, and the thing that really I'm passionate about is, is a chance to do the work I do, but then also to get outside and, and to go skiing with my daughter and my wife or go on, on bike rides with them. And um, that, that, that's, that's what drives me. So thanks for, for sharing all, all of that. And uh, I know how beautiful is the, the Bay Area, especially for outdoors lovers. It's uh, just fantastic except uh, for a period of the time of the year where you get uh, all of those uh, smoke for wildfire and that's uh, getting worse and worse but uh, probably that's yeah. why uh, that's an extra reason for all of us to to fight against uh, all of that so during your um, you know different work and, and life experiences uh, prior to, to start wireframe i mean what did you learn during that journey maybe you have like few you know gold nuggets of experiences in a way that you know we give you an edge to start the firm yeah. So we started Wireframe at the very end of 2016. We spent almost 18 months raising the first fund. It was me and my, my co-founder, Harsh Patel. Um, at that point, both of us had actually been operating and investing in the, our two core themes for a decade, uh, at least a decade at that point. So I built the clean tech practice at my prior firm and uh, I'd known Harsh over that entire period. And we'd had this sort of parallel career path. He'd actually been along with the work he was doing in health and genomics, he'd been investing early in smart grid and e-waste recycling. And so we sort of had this parallel path. We, you know, had the experience of that, you know, first uh, clean tech boom and then bust. And so kind of some scars from it. And I don't know how much we can unpack. We could spend a whole show on that in terms of, <laughs> in terms of lessons. But I think in terms of what we saw in the landscape, you know, in 2016, it was still, this um, this massive the the the, the most uh, significant economic opportunity of our lives uh, around you know for me personally climate and and and, and same with harsh so the health of people the health of planet and also um, just a, an incredibly urgent need from a societal level so those two things sort of tied together very clearly for us and yet we saw thousands hundreds or maybe a thousand plus kind of seed firms springing up and very few sources of capital amongst those seed firms, capital and, 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 and uh, experience that were committed to, to climate. And so it, it sort of um, became an opportunity where we said, there's, there's this opportunity, you know, there, there's, this, there's, this, there's this need that we see, uh, no one is really serving it. Um, we think it's going to be a fantastic place to build the next generation of great companies. It's a multi-decade 
uh, journey and trend. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we started Wireframe. You know, the process of starting anything is, 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 is you always ask yourself the question of why should we exist? Why should we do this? It's the same as starting a company. And so our reason to exist was just that the work we love to do is that early work with founders. And we saw these two, you know, critical themes and areas that no one was really focusing in on as a strong capital partner. So that's, that's, um, that's how we got going. So I always like, like to dig a little bit and, and to understand because you already mentioned this, uh, you know, outdoor like passion that you have and, you know, your family and this uh, nature uh, connection that, uh, that you have. And it's interesting because I would say 99% of the, the founders, investors I interview in the show always uh, mention that uh, in one way or another. But do you have during that, you know, all of those years and maybe prior starting uh, the clean tech uh, practice in the, the previous firm that you were working with, like any specific like aha moment uh, okay. that you can yeah. recall or def define as such that in a way made you th think, okay, now climate and climate tech more than these two opportunities that you just mentioned really uh, is something that I want to dedicate my uh, life for. Yeah. Yeah, so th there is actually a moment that, uh, so I was um, in 2002, I'd uh, been working in, I you know, started my career in banking, tech banking, and then had been in an early stage fund in Palo Alto that was investing in um, basically technology for uh, data centers and enterprises. Um, and I took a trip to Belize and, and my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, now, now wife, uh, had, had got us into scuba diving. So we were, we were doing a trip and you know, when we were there, you know, I'd always had this passion for the outdoors and environmental kind of interest and concern going back to that time about climate. But when I was in those ecosystems and starting to think about and realize the effects of, uh, of coral bleaching with changing uh, uh, climate and of the destruction of some of these amazing but really vulnerable ecosystems that I loved and I love to experience at a personal level and the thought that those were at risk and frankly, that the more visitors and the more economic growth and the more activity, which were essential to all of these communities that happened, uh, yeah, and the more growth clearly in the developing world that, that, that we drove, the more imperiled all of these incredible things would be. Uh, I remember being uh, on, on a plane on the way back and thinking about this sort of like this dichotomy. And, and I really, it, it started me down the path of thinking, how can I do what I love, which is working with startups and technology, but pointing that towards um, this thing that has deep personal resonance that I think is absolutely essential in my lifetime to figure out. So that was that was the moment. And it took a few years then from there to get to the point of, of figuring out how to put that into action. But but um, but that was the starting point. For me. So let's take a, a zoom out now and, and kind of like a, a step back to the you know, U.S. climate tech ecosystem that you're part of. And since uh, uh, even prior to 2016, so you, uh, you, you saw the first round uh, of the clean tech 1.0 bubble. Um, can you give us like an overview of the, of the landscape today? I mean, what are the, the fundamentals that make the climate clean tech market in a way more relevant than ever today? Uh, or are we in a, again in a bubble type of market? I mean, maybe you... You can tell us, like, uh, related to that, which sectors uh, from the traditional industry are the most impacted and, and, uh, and at risk, in a way, with all of those micro changes happening, but uh, also all of those micro change with all of those companies coming uh, into the into market as well. I mean, who is in need of survival? I mean, give us a little bit like your, your opinion on this uh, old dynamic and fundamentals that uh, it's happening right now. Yeah, well, and so maybe to frame kind of where we are, it, it would be helpful just to, to do a quick kind of look back and say, I think that the first, for me, a, a lot of the first decade around clean tech uh, or decade plus, because there's people who were doing this work before, you know, before I was in, in kind of 2002, 2003, and even earlier, but like this first wave was really, a lot of it was around built environment and power and renewables and and, and biofuels, right? So that was a a, a, a big dimension. So, so energy, power, uh, fuels. And um, 
and, and, and that laid a really important foundation, right? So if you think about the price performance uh, curve for, for solar and for wind and, and for batteries and, and, and you know, uh, the success of Tesla as a catalyst in, in, in the EV space, you know, there were some really important things that got funded and got to scale, which then I think created, um, you know, like a substrate or, 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 you know, foundation that we can all build on today. But I think one of the things that's changed over the past few years is we obviously rebranded into climate tech, but there was a reason for that it, because people started to look at the, the, the principal issue that impacts all industries as this, 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 this need to decarbonize. And, and that uh, can, you know, can occur in ag and it can occur in uh, heavy industry and in mobility as well as in energy and power and, you know, and uh, consumer choices. And so there's, there's all of these different dimensions and along with that, so you have, I think, this this you know shift in terms of uh, corporate commitments and consumer awareness of the urgency of the problem. So you're combining uh, a set of tools and capabilities which are far more mature. You have a market which uh, which is feeling a pain, you know, far more greatly than they did before because of the urgency of dealing with climate, because the the effects of it. Are, are here today. And, and as a, a general population, we're seeing them in the wildfires and the extreme events um, that take place. And then you pair that with, I think what we've seen, which is which is really supercharging the, the, the ecosystem, which is capital, which is a far healthier capital stack than existed the first time around. We have uh, a lot of very strong investors uh, who joined us at, at kind of the early stages, but also in the kind of middle stages as well as late stage growth investors, um, people who are specialists in working on project capital, for example, which is really critical to deployment for a lot of things. So you have a, a much healthier capital ecosystem and you also have entrepreneurial talent. You have uh, people who've had success or had experience working in um, you know, companies that are scaling very quickly that decide to go work on climate and so you, you, we're seeing an influx of talent into the space. And so I think all of these things combined make me very optimistic that even though you know we're, I think we're in a period where there's some, um, some, some headwinds and some, some bumps emerging, we have a lot of the core components for this to be a, a really successful area to continue to innovate and build you know massive companies. In. Mm -hmm. And if we take a, you know a closer look at uh, the U.S., um, you know. As a, as a country, as a, as a market uh, in itself. I mean, can you tell us, according to you, I mean, what are the advantages and, and weaknesses in regard to uh, decarbonizing the economy? I mean, are we, as the US, uh, still leading the charge compared to the EU and the rest of the world? Or do you see any major like roadblocks that are slowing down the, the process? I mean, what needs to happen in a way to accelerate the movement and in which timeline do you think it sounds realistic to you. Yeah. So, and just to be clear, we we invest in companies, we'll invest in companies in Europe too, and we even consider investing in companies outside, you know, North America and Europe and, and, and may do so. But um, so I don't, maybe the frame that you put forward, which is where are we in the US relative to others? Clearly, I think um, we're behind the curve in terms of some, you know, dimensions of manufacturing and assembly and, and, and you know, capability relative to others. I think what's interesting about the U.S. is it is a massive market and it's a place where, um, you know, you see you see certain challenges though, right? So you said what are the what are the things? What are the issues? Yeah, you, know, you you have um, you have, for example, a trade case right now that everyone is sitting here watching the solar industry trying to figure out, you know, if we're going to be able to import, continue to import panels and, and to deliver on projects that are in the queue because of potential action uh, on, on this on this trade solar trade case. Um, that, and hopefully that's a short term thing here that, get, that gets resolved. Um, but, you know, you continue to see um, a different, I would say, will at the societal level or interest, I'd say there's a significant portion of the population in the US, which is maybe quite different than other geographies, where there is a resistance or even uh, a, a, an unwillingness to even believe that there's an urgency or need to, to decarbonize. Um, my sense is that that is a little bit different in Europe. There's a, still that there's at least a broader public support uh, or, or acknowledgement of, of, of 
you know, the, the urgency here. So um, I think that that translates in, into, into, into a number of things. And, and one of them is just policy, right? So I think we'd hope to see this big Build Back Better plan passed. Uh, and I think that would have really, uh, that would have really helped. And I think there's, um, I think there's little chance right now, it appears that that really passes in any mean, meaningful way. So, so do, do, do you see like policies, uh, I mean, at, you know, the federal level or the, the you know, the, the state level as like one of the key components to really accelerate uh, the decarbonization of the, of the economy. So meaning like the rolling out all of those technologies that you guys are funding or is it also you know not really everywhere in each uh, part of the economy in itself and um, you know there's still like some r and d's that needs to be uh, funded uh, there's still like some scientists yeah. that probably like develop amazing technology but needs to learn how to market it and you know commercialize yeah. it i mean what are the other roadblocks that you see that today should be changed uh, in order to really accelerate this environment because the timeline is there 2050 is like yeah. what we all have in mind where are we at you know what i mean yeah well and i think you know the reality is we need to even think in shorter time scales 2050 can push a lot of decision making and urgency out into the future and given the time value of carbon i think it's much healthier to say even if you have a 2050 target you need to back that into the next you know maybe 2030 or even within 2030 okay to get to where you want to be in 2030 what needs to happen in the next three years, the next five years? Because if we don't hit those near-term milestones, we're never going to get to 2030. And obviously, the quicker we can pull carbon out of the atmosphere and, and, and out of our economic activity, the better. So, um, in terms of the you, you know policy and, and, and the role of government, we are not investing in technologies that are entirely dependent upon regulatory policy or subsidy or anything like that. But I think there's an opportunity for policy to accelerate the transition. And so we try to look for, for companies that are um, going to have an impact at scale. But and if they if they have a supportive policy landscape, that you know, that that can happen more quickly. So like let me give you an example. Um, you know, obviously everyone talks about a price on carbon. So if there was a price on carbon, I think that would that would help in a lot of ways. But you think about some other dimensions, like the ability to invest in charging infrastructure or the ability to provide incentives for electrification of homes or in heat pump deployment. Um, I mean, I think there's some things that we could do, which would be policy carrots that would accelerate what's already happening. You already see you know, EV sales outpacing forecasts. And I suspect that the next several years that will continue to happen the same way it has with solar and with storage that you, know, you will surprise the upside because once the people start to realize EVs are simply a better product, a better experience, all the automakers are investing their R&D and, and putting you know, the, the coolest uh, new technology into EVs, um, you're gonna find, and, and, yeah, and people start to uh, you know, get over some of their concerns about range and things like that, you're gonna see that this tips much more quickly, um, which is great, but you look in the U.S. at this whole uh, issue recently with what kind of cars are the Postal Service going to buy? Well, gosh, I mean, it's, it's sort of amazing we're having that conversation that you're making a long-term capital investment and you're still considering ICE vehicles when this transition is happening. But that's just one example of where you know, the government could help accelerate something that is already happening. Um, you know, last year, one, Ford uh, bought one of our uh, a company that we invested in this company, Electrify, which was a seed investment we made, and um, they were building software for managing the operations and charging of fleets. Um, and, and Ford has obviously made a significant commitment with their F-150 Lightning and their e-transit vans uh, towards electrification and, and, and transforming that company. So, you know, this, trans, this transition is happening, right? And a company like Electrify with Ford is, is accelerating that. But just imagine if we had a little bit of policy support to do things that ultimately are economically in everyone's interest anyway so oh, and thanks for uh, thanks for sharing so uh, i'd like to get a little bit your, your opinion on you know those um, way of thinking or like you know some you know people think that economic growth uh, could be compatible with sustainability and in a way also reducing the, the global emissions so but sometimes we 
always and often hear that uh, the only way to go is like could be degrowth. So do you think it's still possible on a, in a sustainable manner, creating value and at the same time growing and reducing uh, CO2 emissions at a global level? I think as a pragmatist and a realist, I think it is it, to, to expect you can transition a global economic system um, is an even higher lift than to think that we can decarbonize the system we have. So I think in short, I believe that actually, and we've shown that you can decouple productivity uh, from energy consumption. And I think that there is an opportunity, which is an economic opportunity, which is one of the things that attracts people when they try to figure out where to allocate their talent and their time. Um, and so when I think about the challenge ahead, I'm very much on the page of believing that we can, uh, that we can create economic growth through this transition by designing, inventing, developing, and deploying the technologies and the solutions that help to decarbonize across every industry. Right. I think so. And that's, uh, I think uh, all of the companies and funds funding this, uh, this kind of companies like believe that, uh, that too. And I think that's the most uh, exciting opportunities that uh, can also, I mean, it's happening right now. So with, with the goal in mind to keep this, you know, 1.5, and that's what we hope to, to keep, uh, you know, uh, as a overall temperature increase by 2050. I mean, what is according to you, this, the, the proportion of tech versus nature-based solutions that needs to be uh, implemented? And, and maybe why do you believe it's important to, to push both type of solution? Or do you think technology can solve uh, most likely like 90% of the, of the issues? So, so I, I'm, I'm in the all of the above camp. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll need everything um, because it's a really steep hill. And, but, but maybe to frame, to frame it in terms of what can each provide, uh, there is a lot of technology uh, today that is economically competitive and that we could accelerate deployment on. A classic example in the US, for example, is, uh, is solar, right? And, and soft cost being one of the primary um, uh, dimensions of, of deployment for, 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 for rooftop solar in the US. Um, that is a technology that we could, you know, that we can deploy much more quickly, EVs, other things like this storage, where, where you actually have an opportunity to not have to go into the labs, but to have a big, big impact by uh, accelerating deployment. You're not going to get all the way there, though, on deploying just what we have today. So there's absolutely also a role for investing in uh, longer cycle R&D spending. The, the only thing about that, coming back to time scales, is that if you look at the impact that we have to make over the next 10 years, and the next 20 years, what that says to you is given the timeline from lab to commercialization to scale, you can think typically you know, about a six to eight year or 10 year process. And so if you're developing something today, to imagine that thing in the lab getting through to a scale deployment that has an impact on carbon, it really makes a dent. You're thinking about a decade out, so we don't have that many cycles right left. Like we, 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 this stuff does need to be invested in today, and thankfully there's there is capital going into that. But that's a second dimension that sort of new technology, uh, deep R and D that gets translated into in, in, into something commercial. And then the third is is sort of uh, you know is, is nature and, and ecosystem um, investment, and clearly that's an opportunity too. It can be somewhat fraught, particularly if you start to get into the, the, the carbon uh, offset space, because I think there is um, a lot of fuzzy math. And, 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 and I think there's a lot of uh, people who are trying to look for um, easy solutions, which when you actually look at the uh, carbon impact, uh, probably uh, don't do as much as, as, as they would like. But, but we need to invest in healthier ecosystems. And it's, you know, it, it comes down a little bit. You start to think about land use, you start to think about uh, it's susceptibility to disease and, and fire, for example, in forest ecosystems. Um, so there's um, there's challenges, just, just to say there's challenges in that space as well. But look, we need to do all of it. And I'm glad that there's people who are working across um, that, that whole landscape. So let's go into the, the specifics of uh, wireframe venture. Now, can you tell us a bit more? And you already started to uh, uncover that, uh, I mean, at the beginning of the interview. but. Uh, the, the story, the, the genesis of it, and uh, in, in the really like this uh, initial gap that uh, that you saw that in a way led uh, to the thesis behind wireframe ventures. 
Yeah. Well, and so I think I shared a bit of this. I mean, the thesis was, look, we, we um, have spent a decade working in climate and health, and, and these are the two most important areas we can imagine spending our careers. They're critically important and, and also, you know, for the planet and also, uh, you know, personally to us and they're huge economic opportunities. And so that's why we started because we saw this gap that no one else was doing that very early work or very few others were. Um, when we raised the first fund, it was kind of a, it was a prove it fund, right? Um, we, um, we went out, we, we raised $28 million, 25 companies. Um, we've been really fortunate to have some incredible founders in that group that have built businesses that some of which have already exited uh, and some of which are now really getting to scale. Um, and so that was, that was the path. And for Harsh and I, it, it was a bit of, hey, look, let's get this formula right and prove it. And then as we started to feel like this, you know, we had we had product market fit, like what we were doing was really working. Uh, and we, we had our own cadence and, and firm dynamic down. And then we said, let's go, let's go build this. So we raised the second fund, um, which we announced earlier this year, 77 million. Um, and we brought on uh, 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 Lily Berniker, who'd been investing in climate and health in another firm in New York. Uh, so we have a bi-coastal presence now. And, um, and said, let's, you know, let's continue to do what we're doing. Typically, that means one up to $2 million, you know, first checks. You do a couple hundred thousand in a seed, but up to $2 million first checks. Um, investing most of our time, you know, early with founders in that period leading up to a Series A. And then always having the relationship as, as those companies scale. But, you know, usually stepping off kind of the board formally as other syndicates form so we can reinvest our time in the next set of relationships. So that's been a bit of of the evolution for us. Um, but we're still focused on the same two themes, still focused on investing our time and capital in the early stage uh, and and really wanting to, to build a, you know, a specialist kind of uh, top tier boutique firm um, in this area. And, and I think this is a good segue to, uh, to move to my next question. I mean, and I was reading your, uh, your site, hearing you speaking, and we're like, how do you source those you know, incredible founders and team that uh, you are looking to, to fund and that you are funding? I mean, who should come to pitch you? And can you give us maybe some, some example of previous investments? Uh, I mean, what makes them special, like team, market, tech? Yeah. And maybe which are the, the characteristics for, you know, to be a, an incredible founder as you, uh, yeah. I don't know, I've seen so many founders you probably have now. To start to identify a few characteristics that uh, makes you think like okay this is like uh like a red flag so this is like definitely something that i should uh, pursue in terms of conversation yeah so um just in terms of who we want to talk to what is everything comes back to the founders and team right that that's what we key off of and so just so i can be clear we will invest across technologies so we've invested in synthetic biology computational biology, software, hardware, just pure business model innovations. Like those are all great tools. Uh, we really care about who is like the carpenter, who is wielding those tools and do they have the skills and ability to put them to use towards one of the, the, the themes we're investing in. We also invest across industries. So we aren't vertically focused. We've invested in ag and mobility and circular economy um, and, you know, and obviously power and renewables. And, and so we, we're, we're, we're founder led. Um, and what I mean by that is, is we spend a lot of time figuring, hey, we don't, we, we have an idea about these industries and we know a lot of people in the markets. A lot of our deals come to us through those networks. Um, and, and, and so I'll mention, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but what we're looking for are, you know, can the people, uh, do they have some unique experience that gives them insight into the problem they're trying to solve? They demonstrate an ability to build a world-class product. Are they able to start to recruit um, a compelling group of people around them. Those can be co-founders. They can be people who are prospective partners who've engaged in almost like a customer development, you know, mindset who want to work with them. It can be advisors, but someone as a founder, you need to be able to build this nucleus of people. So do they have that, that uh, capability uh, and the ability to really articulate where they want to go? Um, do they have a view for not just where they build the technology, but how that turns into, you know, product and a business? Um, and, and so to answer your question on, on maybe a little bit with some examples on sourcing, you know, I'd mentioned Electrify. Um, we were introduced to Electrify by a friend who was an exec at ChargePoint and the founder had been at ChargePoint with him and, and, and said, Hey, you should talk to my friend who's starting this business. Then we led that round and, you know, that was a, a 
a fast uh, 18 month period working with them, but a, a tremendous outcome for everyone. Um, uh, you know, was in, uh, introduced, uh, reintroduced actually. So uh, Span IO is a company. Arch Rao is a, a tremendous founder and CEO who had been head of product for Tesla Powerwall. So he designed and launched and run that uh, uh, energy storage business at Tesla. I'd actually first met Arch going back at this point a decade uh, when he was coming out of Stanford doing his first company. And we'd sort of lost touch, but then got reconnected uh, by a mutual friend at, at, at a dinner party. And uh, and it was just as he was leaving Tesla. And that was, you know, when when we got involved and we ended up leaving the seed round and span, which now has raised, you know, 130 million and is reinventing the electrical panel and it's a core part of decarbonizing uh, the home. And we are so excited about, about that relationship in that business. Um, I'll give you maybe one more. So, you know, because that's two flavors. It's, hey, someone that we've either known for a long time and come to us through this, you know, network of people in, 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 in our ecosystem, in the venture ecosystem, one is, the uh, people who we've um, you know gotten there through industry, and then there's a, a, a founder Matt Scullin, who I had backed when he was coming out of Berkeley as a PhD. Uh, I think it was in 20, 2010 or 2011 uh, to do a um, thermoelectric uh, 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 generator company. So taking waste heat and converting it into power. Um, that company didn't actually end up working. We had invested and brought in several investors after us after leaving the seed round and had kind of an up and down road there, but built this tremendous respect for Matt and his capability. And so um, he was pulled in to join a company called MycoWorks, which is working on non-animal, non-plastic. So it's a premium new material um, that's based on mycelium. And when he joined, um, yeah, I knew I'd want to work with him again. And so we had an opportunity to, 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 to come in and, 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 and work with them because it was someone that we'd built this relationship with. It hadn't Work the way we'd all hoped the first time, but we are so excited about what they're what they're building today. So those are a few examples. But I would say we've also invested in, in founders we've met completely cold. Right? We all refer like inbound referrals are always best, and we invest a lot of time in ecosystems where founders are working, um, just to, to mentor and contribute kind of good karma to the ecosystem. But uh, but we have invested um, I think twice so far actually in teams that we've met um, who who came in cold. So. You mentioned that, I mean, you mentioned that you, you guys, it's uh, on like 20 or 25 investments so far with the fund one uh, now looking to, to deploy more. Uh, but with those 20 companies, I mean, if I'm one uh, part of your portfolio, like what, do you, what is the support and the extent of the, uh, of the support I can expect uh, from you? If you can like maybe give us like a, uh, one or two examples of like you know, a situation where uh, really was like critical to support the, the founders or it was not just critical, it was just like everything was fine. And uh, what's the relationship that you uh, that you have and, and the support like in a way why people should, you know, stick around with you and not go to a, another fund? Yeah. So we we think of ourselves as an extension of the team. Um, you know, the founders driving the car, like we are in the back seat, but we, <laughs> you know, and, and as my partner Harsh says, we may be taking a nap sometimes, but like we, we've got, you know, we've got a map and we've got some experience. And so when, 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 when we're asked, we want to be able to be there as a partner because, because, um, you know, I think we have deep networks and expertise in these areas. And the way we look at it is um, we're deep in your themes. We are not going to be on your board at the Series B and, you know, we're not going to be leading your next round. So we're very aligned with you from the beginning and we're investing all of our time in the process of, of, of trying to help you get off to the to the best start and have the best chance of success. Um, that can take shape in a range of ways based upon what a particular founder uh, would like help with and their background. You know, we have recruited uh, with founders, chief, uh, chief technical officers, uh, chief scientific officers, uh, we've we've helped with that team building process. We've we've helped um, with you know we, we always are involved in helping them think about, about uh, capital sourcing for a next round. Uh, but when we when we work with a founder, it's it's a team approach. So it's not a you know this is Paul or Lily's deal or Harsh's deal. We're is a wireframe uh, in relationship. And so what that means is we tend to set up calls every once in a while, which is really time for the founder to. Um, to, to just air whatever is, is, is important with us. And usually it's not just one of us, but it's a few of us because we have complementary backgrounds and skill sets. And, um, and, and, and you know, we have a ton of interaction outside of those too, as needed, but, but we try to make sure that we're bringing 
all of the experience and the resources. You know, Harsh has been a founder twice. I've been investing in climate for 16 years at this point. Um, we, we've, we've seen a lot of different things across all these areas and have deep networks. And so we want to make that available to the teams. And, um, and, and then ultimately, you know, build a relationship that's a trusted, you know, partnership where even as they scale, and, and this, this has happened a few times, scale to kind of unicorn class companies, um, they'll have different boards and professional kind of, you know, mid and late stage investors. We often get the calls though, when something comes up, hey, I want to test drive something, I want to run something past you. I'm thinking about talking about this with my board. I've got a decision to make. And, and so that's the role that we like to be able to play. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, ultimately our success is based on the success of our founders and the fact, like, just as an example, the most recent fund, you know, we had, we had five um, founders who worked with in the past come to us and, and ask to, to invest to basically, you know, to, to, to kind of be a part of what we're doing. And there's nothing more gratifying than that um, because it signifies that they've, you know, they, they, they're putting the trust uh, back in us that like we've had in, in helping them on, on their journey. And thanks for sharing that, but just wondering, like, I mean, what's next then in terms of like, if you guys are uh, increasing the uh, number of like companies and how, how do you plan or like, did you, I guess you, you thought about that already, but like, what would be like the way uh, that you're going to work with those founders? Like, you know, instead of like having 20 companies in the portfolio, you probably have like 60 or 70 or maybe 80. I don't know what's the, the target goals that you guys have, but like, then how do you keep this, uh, these qualities like by uh, increasing the size of the team? Or is it like uh, trying to, you know, maximize the, the time that you can spend or What's uh, I mean? How do you apprehend that, like the, the next uh, few months or few years with this uh, larger fund? You know, it's a great question, and I think you should be a limited partner because that's the same question that we get asked by our by our investors. <laughs> um, but and 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 so it's something we've been really thoughtful in designing that from the beginning, which was you know having come from firms that were Series A and Series B firms, we spent so much of our time on uh, on governance issues and on working through things at those middle stages, and, and so the way we think about you know our investment of time. As I said, is we are all in during that you know pre-seed or seed to Series A phase, mm -hmm. and at that point, you know the company starts to build a broader set of investors around it, which means we don't, you know, typically we're not on the boards at that stage. We're coming off, which frees up a lot of time. So we're always, uh, you, we always have a relationship and can can make a phone call or, or you know text or you kind know, of communicate with the founder ad hoc as something comes up, but it, it we don't have that board time commitment, you know, that, that, that as companies start to scale, which means we can invest that time back in the next set of founders. So yeah. today we, you know, we fund one, we invested in 25 companies. There are 22 that are active today. We've invested in four companies so far in fund two. Um, and, you know, and it's worked quite well. The companies mature, right? They, they have a, their own trajectory. And as they start to, to, you know, some of them will not make it. This is what happens with startups. Um, and obviously, you know, that means that, 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 uh, that they move on to their next thing. And then those that do make it in their scaling tend to have other investors who want to do that middle and late stage um, kind of board work. Um, and we get to, to, to just continue to, 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 to be a, a resource um, when called on. So looking at the, the, the different sectors now in terms of like the, the climate ecosystem in, in general, uh, I mean, which are the, the, the ones that uh, are the most promising uh, for you today in terms of like what I call the impact cash return or ICR? Uh, I mean, meaning like building impactful companies while creating, you know, highly profitable uh, business. Do you see any underdogs or subsectors area that you are the most excited about? Hmm. So there are so say many that you can just there give are so many, but you know, <laughs> mo mobility is a big one. And I think it's because there's a lot of pieces that need to come together. So, you know, we've talked about this already and, and, and we've talked about some of the investments we've made, you know, Electrify Span plays into that. We've invested, we did a pre-seed round in a, in a company called Synop. Um, and uh, they're, they're also a software for, for managing uh, fleet uh, operations and electrification. We've invested in a company called Solo Advanced Vehicle Technology, which is a team from Waymo and Tesla that's uh, helping to electrify heavy charging, or I mean, heavy trucking uh, with, with an electric vehicle. Um, and, and so and we're continuing to look at a lot of companies that are touching on some dimension of electrifying transportation. 
I think there's so much to do there and it's an area that's going to be highly investable, you know, for the next decade plus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that we're, we, we're very excited about. Um, that also ties into electrification of buildings, electrification of the home and of commercial spaces. Um, we, we have, so I'm really interested in, um, in carbon removal. Um, there's been a ton of capital going into that. I think there's a lot of questions about the market. So we're looking for a set of companies that we think can kind of thread a needle in terms of being able to hit a price point that's compelling and being able to generate a business that has inherent advantages over a lot of the, uh, the people who are raising capital that are gonna take enormous amounts of money to get to project scale deployment uh, and, and, and still have huge technical risk. And, and so I think we're looking at some things in that space. One, one investment that we've made there is a company called Climate Robotics. Uh, which is using biochar in field. They, they have a modular pyrolyzer that allows them to take the biomass in field and convert it into biochar in a, in a very cost efficient way, which has value to the grower and, and to the health of the soil, but also has a very high quality um, you know, carbon, uh, carbon removal sequestration method, which um, is a natural solution, but has some of the dimensions that are really attractive from, from technical solutions. So that like that is one example right in that space um okay and out of the the pitches that uh, that you hear like i mean which one you know you believe makes like no sense whatsoever and it sounds like it might be a waste of time or, or resource or even like greenwashing i mean maybe you can mention one example no need to name any companies if you don't want to shame them publicly but uh... <laughs> yeah you know so i am um... Look, I think that we're in the business of being optimists and of believing that things that generally are uh, the people think are, are are unachievable can actually can actually be done. So I, I am I am very hesitant to call out any specific company. I would say uh, areas that um, I think we have questions about relative to the capital that's gone into them and the speed that it takes to build the ecosystem and the infrastructure. Um, yeah, you know, areas like like hydrogen. It's not to say we, you know, we're looking at that and same thing as carbon removal. I just think there's so much capital and so much interest that we're saying that we look at those areas and we say there's opportunities there, but let's be realistic about what it takes to build a business at scale. Um, and, uh, and 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 so you know we 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 want to invest in founders who are uh, who are ambitious, but also acknowledge like the different steps of value creation, and capital formation along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this overlays with what I think we're seeing in the broader public markets and in tech, which will impact um, climate, which is, you know, it's going to be, I think, a, a bit more challenging to raise the next round than it has been for the last couple of years. And so you're going to, great companies will get funded, but that's based upon hitting key technical milestones and starting to show how things turn into a business, you know, starting to show real commercial metrics. Um, and, uh, and so th that's... That's maybe my commentary on 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 you know what are some areas that, that we are interested in, but also you know uh, you know careful about. Yeah, and and maybe we we're speaking about that uh, at the beginning of the interview. I'm just quickly looking at the time. We're kind of like running out of time as usual. But uh, uh, can I guess maybe just a little bit like your opinion as a you know active investors right now related to this? Uh, and we're speaking about that the the, the slowdown and the, the in terms of like VC capital allocated to to companies. We see this. Uh, potential recession uh, coming or we're already in according to uh, to some uh, growth capital start to dry out a little bit so how do you see that in terms of strategy in terms of like you know keeping uh, aside your yeah. protected babies yeah. that you invested in <laughs> yeah the future capital you want to deploy well, well so uh, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball but you know i think both harsh and i have, have we've been through two cycles before we've been through the you know the, the dot com boom and bust and 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 we've been through the 08 uh, period. And so you can't predict the depth or duration of these things. And clearly you're seeing a market correction, which is you know 30% down on the NASDAQ, 20% down on the S&P. And people, some people think there's more room to go. And, and I, who knows, like I said, I don't have a crystal ball, but, but what you can start to do is plan for it. And so I think it's realistic to think that uh, in the next couple of years, the, you know, the bar will move, valuations will change. So how that translates into what we're doing is with both companies that we've already funded, as well as 
with new companies, it's it's sitting down and and planning for that meeting. Hey, you know, are you committing all of your resources if you're very early towards achieving product market fit from a people standpoint, from a capital standpoint? Are you doing the, the core things necessary for you to demonstrate what you need to to hit what is going to be a higher bar? And then are you realistic about how much capital might be available at a given valuation in a new market environment? Because you might find that what was, you know, a uh, hundred million dollar round on a billion dollar valuation for a company before all of a sudden it's moved and you need to pull in 40 or 50 million at something that's far lower. And, you know, can you adjust your business planning so that you can still continue to make rapid progress on key dimensions, but just think about how you um, break that up a little bit differently than, than in a time where capital was more available. Um, and, and this will impact climate. I mean, look, what we benefited from a very low rate environment, both in terms of the value of equities, but also in terms of deployment, right? So if you have, um, if you have to make investment in, 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 in projects and, 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 you know, and, and putting um, capital into the ground, you know, your, your interest rates are going to be higher. The cost of those things is going to be higher. So you're accounting for all of that in your plans. So last question that I have for you. Um, I mean, what's your personal view on the climate crisis? Are we doomed? Uh, what would you say to you know people who feel demoralized and see all of those like visible consequences already? Like, I mean, of climate change. What would yeah. be your words on that? What's your thought? Yeah, I, I, I'm an optimist that we'll figure it out. I'm concerned that it's going to be that it's going to be too late, uh, meaning for uh, too late for us to. Um, continue to enjoy all of the things that we do in the way we, we have them today. So I'm concerned about, I'm a huge skier. Uh, I came out to California because I, I had easy access to Lake Tahoe. I'm concerned about, you know, whether my daughter, when she's an adult, will be able to ski in Lake Tahoe. Um, I, I think that there's some thresholds that we're passing, which, you know, look, at some level, that's a recreational activity, but it's also an economic uh, driver for that community. Um, and so I think that, that there's really a complicated set of things around, around climate, which is I think that we will avoid the worst of the worst and we will still have a, a place that can support, you know, human life and a, a reasonable quality of human life. But I also am realistic that I think we're starting to rapidly pass those posts on the road that, that, that signify the ability to kind of have, you know, the incredible ecosystems that, that I have certainly enjoyed um, growing up. David Attenborough gave a speech last year which was striking on this, uh, and, and and if people haven't seen that, um, they should they should they should check that out. Um, but I think that the more ways we can more quickly reach not just this community but the broader public with a message that connects to them, the better. And uh, I don't know what all those ways are. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this organization, Protect Our Winners, which is trying to connect uh, outdoor enthusiasts and the outdoor community with climate change. Um, people who may not have thought about climate, but they do think about um, you know, hiking or skiing or, or you know, or, or, or uh, water sports or whatever, whatever it is that they love. And I think the more we can do to um, bring these messages and bring a positive message of, of there's an opportunity to take action, the better. So how can the, the community of, uh, you know, LPs, founders, investors looking and listening to the, this show can help you? Well, we we love to talk to anyone who, who has great solutions and ideas for for solving climate so i think for, for founders you know we we, we um we'd love to speak with you um we're fortunate to have a great set of lps we're always starting we're always looking to build new relationships you know we in our current lp base nature conservancy is one of our lps we have a, a family office called three Carns, which we mentioned which is committed to to uh, climate solutions and, and, and just a, a broader set of, of amazing um, families and individuals and foundations uh, in our theme. So we want to continue to, to, to build those relationships for future funds. Um, and, um, and in terms of partners, you know, we, we know a lot of the people who are our co-investors, but it's terrific. There's so many new people who've entered the space. And so we would love to continue to build those new relationships with all of the, the, the talent, um, both looking for operating roles, but also looking to start um, other investment funds that we can, we can work alongside. So we should, and, and anyone can, can, can reach out to me. Uh, you know, I think you can include my email or, or my LinkedIn and, and, and um, happy to happy to connect with folks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for your time and uh, incredible insights uh, on the industry. I'm so excited to see so many, you know, brilliant people like you, uh, you know, putting all the time and effort and energy to support founders finding solutions for a better world. So thank you so much. Thanks for the time. It's been great speaking with you.
Hi, it's Guillaume again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As I said, do not hesitate to share an episode with a friend. Also, if you value the work we do for the climate tech ecosystem, here is how you can contribute to it. Today, I'm asking for your support and a donation or sponsorship to make the work of our self-funded team more viable. Even a small contribution means a lot to us. In any case, I will invite you to subscribe to our channels and visit our website startupbasecamp.org to discover more episodes like this one and get your membership to access all our members' exclusive content. So remember, all of this is possible because of your support and donation. And we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. Let's keep in touch and I hope you will enjoy our next show with us.